Hello, and welcome to Accounting 320, Fraud Detection and Deterrence. My name is Dr. Brandon Schweitzer. You may call me Dr. B. And we are in the fall 2022 semester, and I welcome all of you to our course. As we explore the course, I want you to think about what fraud detection and deterrence means. Here we'll be talking about how we examine, identify, detect, and deter fraud uh, as we look at the principles and standards for fraud. We will be looking at the different types of fraud, assess organizational characteristics that are conducive to fraud, and ultimately develop a plan to detect and deter fraud. We'll be looking at a lot of different topics throughout this course, such as the fraud triangle, cash larceny, tech, check tampering, skimming, registered disbursement schemes, cash receipt schemes, billing schemes, payroll and expense reimbursement issues, asset misappropriations, corruption, accounting principles, and fraud. As we look at things like fraud, fraudulent financial statements, whistleblowing, interviewing witnesses, and how to write reports on plans to detect and defer, deter fraud. In Accounting 320, we will uh, talk about all those things in each week through your weekly readings. So as you're get, getting started in this course, I would like you to first review the syllabus, uh, look at uh, the course policies, and examine how the course is laid out. It's also important that you review in depth and the assignments and the project, understand the requirements for the assignments and the project, uh, discuss the content, and uh, understand what the expectations are for each assignment. And uh, we'll do that throughout each week. So before we jump into the week one content overview, I'd like you to take a look at the classroom. When you enter the classroom, it'll look like this. You'll have a home, your home page will have the announcements that I will be posting each week. And it'll also contain uh, the calendar of when things are due. We can see that in the first week, we have current events report due uh, on August, th the second week of this course. And you'll we'll also see uh, what else is, is due. So let's take a look in the classroom. The first area I want you to take a look at is the syllabus. The syllabus has, of course, the course overview, introduction, outcomes, any materials, uh, the guidelines, grading information, which, of course, is very important. That's what everyone's always interested in, grading information. Uh, it'll also have the project descriptions, academic policies, a lot of policies, <laughs> grading information, and, of course, the course schedule. So I want to call your attention to two key areas on the syllabus. Well, three key areas, I guess. First and foremost is going to be grading information. You'll notice that the categories are broken out by learning activities, participation, uh, three, the, uh, the course project, current event reports. Uh, there's an assessment and a presentation. So it's, it's broken out like this. In the second week of this course, you'll have your first current event report due. It's worth a total of 10% of your total grade. So it's very important that you complete uh, the current event reports. And in order to achieve success in this course, it's very important that you complete everything. Don't pass up on any opportunity for points, okay? It's very important that your work is also done on time. As you will become aware, everything in this course is due on Tuesday night of each respective week. Here at UMGC, 
our weeks run from Wednesday morning to Tuesday evening. So it's really important that you complete each task on time. Additionally, you'll also notice that there are discussions in each week. With respect to the discussions, here are my expectations. You should have your original discussion post, your first post, for each discussion completed by, we'll say, Saturday night. The reason why I'd like you to do it by Saturday night is because it will allow ample opportunity for you and your classmates to then respond to the original post. So have your original post completed by Saturday night. That would be an ideal situation. Okay. By Tuesday evening of each week, you, you should have completed your two responses to classmates. And that would complete a mm, ideal discussion. So one original post by Saturday night and two responses to two of your classmates by Tuesday night of each week. And that would be an ideal situation for a discussion forum. Uh, so please do your best to, to do that. That will, of course, count toward participation and it'll count toward uh, the discussion forums themselves. Uh, and then of course, you know, just be mindful of the due dates for each week, what you have to do each week. There's a lot going on in this course. There's a lot of research, uh, a, a lot of involvement with research and writing. So it's very important that you that you maintain to be on top of, of the content in each week. The other area I want to call your, your attention to is going to be, uh, of course, at the very bottom, which are when things are due, when's, what's happening, right? This is kind of like the course calendar. So you see there's a lot going on each week. There's a learning uh, activities discussion. There is uh, a couple of case responses that you have to do. There's a case presentation. Uh, there's three parts to the project. So it's a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on in each week. My recommendation for success is to really try to think about working ahead. It, it'll it'll definitely save you um, some time and planning. So that, that is my recommendation for success. So please, on your time, review the syllabus. And uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me, call me, set up office hours. And of course, you can get in touch with me through the discussion forums uh, in the Ask the Professor area. So that's the syllabus. I, I did also want to talk a little bit about the layout of the course. So under content, you will see that the course is designed uh, in a modular format. On the left, you'll have the overview and you'll have a lot of important information. So, so it's a start here. So we'll start there. Uh, I recommend that you go through all of these. They will certainly help you to set you up for success. Under e-reserves, you'll find uh, the, the course textbook, which is the Corporate Fraud Handbook by Joseph Wells. The fourth edition is the book that we use in this course. I strongly recommend that you follow the course calendar and you know, read through the chapters, right? Uh, these other links are also here for your success. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of really good information here. So so please, uh, I recommend that you read through all of these. You also see one that says Gline. Gline is a external tool that we have set up for you. And this is really for practice. Uh, nothing here is going to be graded in Gline. But the Gline area is really designed to help you to practice uh, questions that you might see, especially if you're taking the CPA exam or the CFE or uh, one of the other credentials that involve any type of fraud detection and deterrence, this would be a great opportunity for you to uh, get involved with, with some free uh, or no cost practice with questions that you might see on a certification exam. 
So that is the purpose of Glyme uh, in our class. Again, nothing is graded on, on this component, but it's, it's really there for your practice. And uh, I'll set that up for you um, very early, early on in the class. So that way you'll have the opportunity to see those kinds of practice questions. The accounting toolkit is also here for you. Uh, the, the toolkit is has a lot of really great content when it comes to uh, what's going on in accounting, accounting concepts. Uh, it, it's a lot of your other courses in our accounting program will pull information from here. So this is a really great area to just kind of uh, get familiarized or maybe you forgot a couple of uh, concepts in the past, you'd be able to find those here. So the, the toolkit is really kind of all encompassing when it comes to accounting. So please feel free to explore that. Of course, to ask your professor, ask the professor discussion, the questions will come right to me and I will respond. I, tr I usually try to respond within 24 hours or less. And of course, that brings us to week one. The way the weekly content is designed is there'll be a short overview. The link to the, the textbook is always going to be there. And then you'll see uh, the learning resources for each week. These are additional resources. Uh, I do always recommend that you go through these because there is a discussion forum in each week where the discussion prompt will ask you what you learned from the readings and how you can these can be applied to your career or or to uh, your experience, right? And so th uh, th what that does is it helps to connect the content to your experiences or to your, to your career. And then in each week, there'll be some discussions. So for this week being the first week, you have introductions, a scavenger hunt, the weekly readings, which is again, connected to the week one learning resources. And the uh, most one of the most important ones, current events topic one. In this discussion forum, you will be uh, telling me what you want to study for your first uh, current events topic. Now that topic you will be finding from the FBI's uh, white collar crime website. And going back to the PowerPoint presentation, For week one, we talked about the readings. We talked we talked about what's due, but you'll see here it's it's from the FBI.gov's white collar crime website. And where would you find that? You might ask. Excellent question. So if you if you come back to week one, you'll see down here it says course pr projects. Select that link, and it'll open up all of the project descriptions for this course. There are three current event reports for this course. I strongly recommend that you use the FBI's database for white collar crime involving the types of fraud that we cover in this course, which there's a lot of them, as you would expect. So if you click on that uh, link, it'll bring you to the FBI's website. And you'll be able to see quite a few, unfortunately, quite a few uh, instances of fraud. And so uh, think about one that's interesting to you, like embezzlement or uh, which happens all the time, unfortunately, or falsification of, of accounting records, again, happens quite frequently, money laundering, et cetera, right? There are so many different kinds of white collar crime fraud that occur. Ponzi schemes, uh, uh, there's so many different, there's tons and tons and tons. I strongly encourage you to find one from the current month uh, but it has to be something with it that happened within the last 12 months or less. Um, the most recent ones are the most entertaining ones. So that, that's why I always recommend that they're as current as possible, right? So 12 months or less, select uh, one of those uh, one of those cases, and then you'll write about the case, right? Uh, it's uh, I'm not looking for a whole lot. It's you know a couple of pages, right? Uh, full paragraphs, obviously, I try to stay away from lists. I'm not, not a big fan of lists or, or bulleted lists. I want to see full paragraphs. 
So don't just give me bullet points. It's not going to cut it. Okay. These are reports. So they're designed to be written like reports. Uh, make sure that you include your resources, APA style um, uh, for your references, reference list. And uh, please make sure that you do in-text citations. That's also very important. So in-text citations and reference lists. Uh, if you have trouble doing that, make sure that you uh, contact the Writing Center because they have wonderful resources to help you to better understand how to write an APA format. Uh, so the way that these reports are written. So the summary, it's about one pet paragraph summary about the case in your own words. Uh, and then there's, I'm looking for a couple of paragraphs, about two to four, preferably four, uh, talking about the, the case, right? So analyzing the case, you know, answering these key questions, right? So as you're answering these key questions, make sure that you're you know, formulating how you're going to write that out in the full paragraphs. And then this is just a concept example of, of what that looks like. And you can see that in chapter three of the handbook. And then of course, make sure that you're adhering to our policies on academic integrity and honesty. Uh, so, so what that, what I mean by that is stay away from direct quotations you know, make sure that you paraphrase, don't direct quote. Uh, that's, it, it, it's, it's better to paraphrase and use in text citations than it is to direct quote. Okay. Um, and also what I encourage you to do, in addition to finding the case in the FBI's database, look the case up, do, do a, a search on the internet for the, the case that you selected to find more information about it. You'll find newspaper articles. You'll find, you, you might even find course fi uh, 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 court case filings on the case. So definitely do a, an intensive search for your selected case. That will certainly help. And so there, there are three of those throughout the term, throughout the next eight weeks. There are three current event reports. The first one is due in week two. Uh, okay, so that is all of week one. So let's move into week two. In week two, you'll have another reading list. You'll also be reading a few chapters from the course textbook. And in the second week, there are two major things happening. Well, there's three, but two major, right? You'll have your dis discussion on the reading list, the resource list. But you'll also have uh, the submission for that current events report that we just talked about. So you'll be submitting it in week two. So that gives you two full weeks to, to really write a great report. And in week two, you'll also be selecting a new current event article for your second current event report, which will be due later on. <laughs> so uh, so week two will be very exciting. Let's take a look in the classroom at week two. So we're going back to our table of contents and coming down to week two. You'll have your learning resources there. The discussion for the weekly readings, you'll select your second current events topic. This is the same way that you did it for week one. And you'll be submitting your current event report that you selected in week one. You'll be submitting the report in week two. So that, uh, and that will be due on August 30th. Of course, if you ever have any comments, questions, or concerns about anything that happens during the week, please make sure to reach out to me. You can email me, call me, set up office hours. Uh, and then, of course, you can always get a hold of me through the discussion form, Ask the Professor. Because oftentimes, students will have this a similar question. So please feel free to check there. It's a great area. Uh, and with that, I want to go back to our PowerPoint presentation because we've come to the fun part of today's discussion. And that is a game I like to call fraud or not fraud. <laughs> So uh, let's take a look at what we got. 
Okay. And this is a, a relatively short video that I uh, encourage you all to watch. So please stand by. There are six main types of embezzlement. Let's take a look at those now. Siphoning. This is common in frontline workers in stores or restaurants. They devise a way of pocketing money from the register without creating discrepancies between recorded sales and the cash drawer. Check kiting. To do this, a criminal makes a series of deposits and withdrawals between several banks. By taking advantage of the float time between banks, the perpetrator gets an interest-free loan. A person that handles the bill paying function at a corporation would be able to perpetrate this crime. Lapping. Embezzlement of this type is found in the area of the business responsible for incoming payments from customers or vendors. A customer working in this capacity could use bank deposits for several companies and change the allocation of the funds to cover up their own embezzlement of cash payments from certain customers. This accumulation of funds obtained while in a trusted position a fiduciary responsibility would qualify as a money laundering scheme. Payroll. Using the company payroll to illegally take money is another type of embezzlement. A corporation will often have a manager or an entire department involved in the calculation and completion of payroll duties. By adding friends or family that are not employed with the company to the payroll, they would be able to effectively steal from the company. Kickbacks. Employees involved in purchasing activities in any organization could be prospective embezzlers through kickbacks. This scheme involves a vendor from whom the company purchases materials in the course of their business who agrees to give an employee money or gifts if they continue to buy a certain product or service from them. These situations often involve inflated prices since the vendor is likely trying to profit personally as well. Overtime. Another way that people can commit embezzlement is through the falsification of overtime records. An hourly paid manager from the local branch office of the bank could do this. If they punched in their card at the beginning of their shift and then left at the end of their regular shift, say eight hours later, without punching their card, then two hours later, pretending to have forgotten something, they come back and secretly punch out their card then. If the manager is continuing to do this over time, he is guilty of embezzlement by falsifying his overtime records. These examples of embezzlement make the relationship of an embezzler much more clear. They must be in a position of authority in the organization and responsible for the property that they are attempting to steal. And those are just some examples of embezzlement. Uh, we've seen many other versions uh, as a lot of people are getting pretty creative when it comes to finding ways to take extra money from either their employer or their customers or someone else. So uh, a couple of excellent questions uh, and scenarios of potential fraud. The first one is an employee gives a customer a discount without a, without a discount code or a coupon. Is this fraud or not fraud? That's an interesting scenario. Employee gives a customer a discount without a discount code or a coupon. Is this fraud or not fraud? Think about, I want you to think about the income statement here for a second, okay? We ring a sale through and we put the sale into the accounting record. 
when we put the sale into the accounting record, we have the expectation that we will be recording a, uh, let's see, we'll be recording the transaction, right? We will be Uh, the, well, there's there's technically two parts of the transaction, right? There's a debit to the cost of goods sold. There's a credit to the inventory. There is uh, the debit and the credit for the actual sale itself. You know, of, of course, that debit would be the cash or to accounts receivable, and that credit would be to sales or uh, merchandise sales or whatever, whatever it is, right? In thinking about those transactions, if there is no discount line item associated with that sale, and you're selling it at a discount without entering such a line item, Technically, that might be a fraudulent transaction because we did not properly allocate the discounted amount, right? In other words, we may have understated our sales amount by the discounted amount, which technically is fraudulent. So that's an interesting scenario uh, and situation that can be interpreted either way, really. It's, it's a very uh, dicey area, which is why I chose this that particular scenario, because it's interesting. The second scenario here is a sale of a service is recorded as unearned revenue before the service is rendered, is it fraudulent or not? or not? Think about this for a second. The sale of the service is recorded as unearned revenue before the service is rendered. You need to think about the definitions here. Unearned revenue. Unearned revenue shows up on your balance sheet, unearned revenue shows up on your balance sheet and it shows up under liabilities, okay? It's unearned revenue. It shows up on your balance sheet under liabilities. The reason for that is because when you collect cash from a customer before the services are rendered, it is unearned revenue, and it is a liability because you have not yet performed the good or the service. And so, therefore, you cannot declare it as revenue. It is unearned revenue. So the definition of unearned revenue is accurate. It is a liability. It's unearned before because we collected the cash before we provided the good or the service. So this is not fraudulent. This is a standard practice in accounting. We would record a, a sale of service as unearned revenue if it's before the service is rendered. So this would be not fraudulent. It's important that you understand the definitions of uh, line items like unearned revenue because it could be um, used for other purposes. So it's it's really important that you understand exactly why you would see an account like unearned revenue. And the same can be settled with prepaid expenses. So things to think about. How do these apply to real life? Uh, I could give you some experience situations. Um, I spent several years as a financial controller for a very large hotel organization in New York state in my previous life and in, in industry. And as the financial controller, I was responsible for uh, 
the oversight uh, of the financial statements, of the auditing, of the budgeting, you know, accounts payables, receivables, payroll, etc. The list goes on, right? Uh, and in those experiences in the hotel business, we have a lot of different people that work in the hotel. We have servers and bartenders that work in the restaurant at the hotel uh, and also for, you know, room service, et cetera. Banquets, uh, weddings, you name it, right? We have servers and bartenders. Servers and bartenders, let me tell you, uh, a lot of cash goes through their hands. Anytime they, there is a position where a lot of cash goes through hands, there is a great potential for fraudulent activity like skimming. Okay. Uh, very, very common, unfortunately, in the industry, uh, of the hospitality industry. So what happens? And here's an example. Let's say uh, you are at a restaurant and you're out with your family at a restaurant and the the uh, server comes over to your table. They take your order. A little while later, they bring you your food. And then, you know, a little while later, they bring you the check. Now, on the check, uh, they might say, hey, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a discount if you're paying with cash, right? Uh, that, that Usually that's a red flag, but it, some places do this. And, so, you know, okay, so you pay with cash. The server then goes to the uh, point of sale system, enters the full amount and pockets the rest. Okay. Uh, or enters the discounted amount and pockets the rest. Yeah, that happens. Uh, here's another example, and I've I've seen all of this happen. I, you know, this this is real life stuff. One time, I was uh, observing the bartending staff, and at the restaurant, and they would uh, provide. Oh, my favorite! The front desk would provide coupons to late arrivals at the hotel to go to the bar and receive. Uh, receive a free drink, okay? Or 10% off at the bar or 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 some type of food voucher. I've seen it, I've seen all of that. And so the guest would go to the bar and they would order food or beverage or whatever. And the bartender would then ring in the sale. apply the coupon, but before they apply the coupon, they would hand the guest the full check. The guest would either pay the full check or pay this kind of amount if they had some other coupon or whatever. The bartender would go back to the point of sale system, register it as a coupon, put the coupon in, put the cash in his pocket. Okay. Yeah, that... It happens. I, I've seen it happen. It's unfortunate, but a lot there's a lot of types of those kind of schemes that happen in industries where there's a high volume of cash changing cans. So uh, things to look for. The front desk. Uh, sometimes uh, guests would arrive late from the airport in a cab instead of using the hotel's um, shuttle service. That happens from time to time. And when that happens... Commonly, what will happen is the front desk will use the petty cash that the front desk has to either reimburse the guest or pay the cab driver directly. Uh, so what happens is the guest or the cab driver will hand the front desk a receipt for the services rendered, right? The, the cab service. The uh, front desk agent will then pay the cab driver or reimburse the guest. And 
uh, there would be a, what's called a voucher system. They would use a voucher system for the reimbursement of the petty cash fund. And sometimes that those uh, documents would be uh, um, altered in a fraudulent way. And so the cash difference would go in the front desk agent's pocket sometimes. Yeah, it happens. Uh, accounting staff. Sometimes accounts payable will pay a bill that the hotel received. They'll void the check. Oh, and this is a very common fraudulent experience. They'll void the check and they will write the check in their own name. Sometimes that happens. And the only time that that happens is when there's no oversight. There has to be a separation of checks and balances. You have to have more than two parties signing a check because it creates a system of checks and balances. If you have one person and one person alone that's in charge of writing checks and paying the bills, you're setting yourself up for fraudulent activity. Back of the house staff. Uh, I've seen servers at restaurants in the back of the house or, or at banquets not reporting tips uh, on, on their statements. Huge, common, very common uh, instance of, of fraud where the servers don't report their tips. Uh, yeah, that's that happens a lot uh, in the industry. So those are my stories from my experience. Uh, there's a lot more. <laughs> and I'm sure that you all have had some interesting experiences as well or things that you've seen. So please feel free to share those in class. Those are always exciting. And as always, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns throughout the next two weeks as you're going through the course content, please feel free to email me, call me, set up office hours, whatever you need. I'm here for you 100% of the time. And uh, as always, I'd like you all to stay safe, wash your hands, do the right things, and uh, I'll post a, another video in two weeks. So thank you all so much for your time today. Appreciate you. Best of luck. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.